Feel the power. Welcome to Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, Facebook family and friends. What a joy to be able to welcome you today to this wonderful broadcast. You know, it's always a joy to serve you the grace of God to teach you the word of God. Just before we get into the service of today, I want to also mention, if you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship, where you're able to learn with other brethren and beyond learning, where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you're being selfish. You're denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. Fasting your seat bells right now as I take you into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. The legal and vital work of salvation. Open with me to Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give them more energy to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Next verse. God also, bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Glory to God. Jesus' redemption for sin involves sickness and atonement for bodily healing. Jesus asked somebody a question in the book of Luke chapter 5, verse number 17, and I'm going to read to verse 20. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. And it was a very, very significant aspect of Jesus' ministry on earth. He was always teaching. As he was teaching, there were doctors of the law and Pharisees sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Next verse. Behold, men brought in a bed a man, which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. Next verse. And when they could not find what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the mist before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, when he saw their own faith, not his own faith, their own faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. The man didn't ask for forgiveness. He gave it to him as a gift. Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Because the forgiveness of sin is not an answer to prayer. The forgiveness of sin is a gift of God's grace. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Next verse. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? next verse but when jesus perceived their thoughts he answering said unto them what reason ye in your hearts next verse whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say rise up and walk which one is easier next verse you will like the next verse but that you may know 
that the son of man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thy house. So he now said, which one is easier? To forgive his sin or to heal him of his body? Jesus asked that question because what Jesus, you know, was doing there was a rhetorical question. It was actually a rhetorical question. He meant to deal with sin is much more important and harder. Because forgiveness of sin is much more important and harder than to deal with sickness. Because sickness is a byproduct of sin. And I'm not dealing with individual sin here now, but we're dealing with the state of sin. Sickness is a byproduct of the state of sin. Obviously, in our religious mind, it's easier for people to accept that Jesus died for their sin than to actually believe that he died for their healing. But if Jesus forgives sins, then it's much easier for Jesus to heal bodies. Because if he forgives sin, which is the root from where sickness came, if he deals with the root, then the branches are not a prayer point. The branches are not an issue. So the one that is hard to deal with is sin. So if God can forgive my sin, then he can heal my body. If the death of Jesus can handle transgressions, transgressions from the first testament to eternity past, if the death of Jesus can handle transgressions, then sickness is not a big deal for the redemptive work of Jesus. Look at Psalm 103 verse 1. And brother David was writing, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Next verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. This was before Jesus died. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, then because of there is forgiveness, then he healeth all thy diseases. So it goes hand in hand. The forgiveness of sins goes hand in hand with the healing of our bodies. With the healing of diseases. The truth is, healing is a proof that forgiveness of sin is real. Healing is a proof that forgiveness of sin is real. You know, it's easy to say we don't plead the blood. And it's easy to say we don't cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus because we really don't cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus and we don't plead the blood. All of those are things that came into the church due to lack of revelation knowledge. Now, so we want to quickly examine, did Jesus shed his blood at Calvary? Did Jesus shed his blood at Calvary? Because sometimes we sing songs like this in the church. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. So the question is, was it at the cross that Jesus shed the blood? And remember, we're dealing with epignosis, accurate knowledge. We're not dealing with trial and error. So we're going to go intelligently in this study. So the thing is, the shedding of blood. Is there anything like shedding of blood in the scriptures? The truth is, redemption did not take place at the cross. Redemption did not take place at the cross. The cross is used for identification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Next verse. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. 23 of the same chapter. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. We preach Christ crucified. That statement tells you he is not referring to Jesus singularly on the cross. Now, he is not. This is the gospel. 
So he is using identification. Let's examine the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. Next verse. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the death on the cross. He was brought down from the cross. And he was buried in the grave. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Next verse. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Next verse. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, we are baptized into his death? Next verse. That therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in the newness of life. So we are crucified with Christ, we are buried with Christ, and we rose with Christ. It is called identification, and the cross is the symbol of that identification. So the message of the cross, which Paul talked about, is not the tree called the cross, the tree, no. But rather, what the cross symbolizes for us. It's not the event at the cross, no. It is what the cross symbolizes. You know, there were three of them on the cross, Jesus and the two malefactors. The cross was the place where a criminal is executed. The cross was a place where the criminal or a criminal is executed. So Jesus going there is identification. Because the work of redemption goes beyond that identification to the price that was paid. The work of redemption goes beyond identification to the price that was paid. Jesus did not shed his blood on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Well, we have seen that at the age of eight, Jesus as a Jew was circumcised. And when he was circumcised, blood came out of his foreskin. In the garden of Gethsemane, blood flowed out of his body as he prayed. When he was beaten by the soldiers on the way to Golgotha, Blood gushed out of his body as they were beating him. When they put on him the crown of thorns, blood gushed out of his body. Just the flowing of blood, just the flowing of blood. That means he bled five different times. Circumcision on the way to Golgotha, during the beating, when they put the crown of thorns, when they nailed him, I mean blood was coming out of his body. But that flowing of blood was not the payment for your sins. That blood that was coming out of his body on the way to Golgotha was not the payment for your sins. So let's do some intelligence so we know exactly what he means by the blood. What he means by the blood. We have redemption through his blood. Which of the blood? The one that came out of his body as red liquid or which one? So let's do some intelligence. Look at the book of Luke chapter 24 verse 44. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Next verse 45. Then open ye their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day. So if we are students of the Bible, we will be able to see where the event of his death in scripture was, so we can understand what it means for his blood to be shed. So we can understand the meaning of the shedding of blood. Look at Luke chapter 22 verse 20. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. 
which is shared for you. Matthew 26 verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. First John chapter 2 verse number 1. My little children, these things write are unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, verse 2, who is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding, shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So we have seen remission of sins. We have seen propitiation for our sins all in the blood. We have seen the shedding of blood. We have seen that the blood makes an atonement for the soul. That means the atonement of the blood was instituted in the Old Testament. The atonement of the blood is instituted in the Old Testament as a shadow. As a shadow or what we call a skia. And we will look at it very spiritually and intelligently because carnally, if we are thinking carnally, we will say the shedding of blood is when you give somebody a cut with a knife or a razor in any part of their body and blood comes out. But that is looking at it carnally. That is not looking at it scripturally. Or when you kill somebody, they say he shed his blood. Even the Bible says they are swift to shed innocent blood. But that's not the context that we are talking about in the shedding of the blood of Jesus. We are referring to a redemptive act. A redemptive act. In this context, shed blood, that statement is a scriptural concept shed blood we must understand how jesus spoke about it so let's examine a few scriptures more hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 but christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building that means the blood of the new covenant it's not the blood of animals. It's the blood of Jesus. But the statement, the atonement for sin by blood, did not come with Jesus. It was there before Jesus came. It was instituted in the shadows. That is why Jesus said, if you read the Old Testament, if you read the law and the prophets, it is already spoken of me. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That is, whatever they wrote in the Old Testament was concerning Jesus. So the scriptures testify of him. So we can see that the act that took place in the Old Testament was a type. That is, we will only learn that act when we come into the new covenant. What they did symbolically in the Old Testament. Becomes only a reality to us. When we come into the new covenant. The old covenant means the law. The practice of shedding blood under the law. Was for the atonement of sins. The propitiation of sins. The atonement of sins. The propitiation of sins the forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins. So the shedding of blood deals with sins. The shedding of blood deals with sins. It deals with the atonement of sins, the propitiation of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the remission of sins. So the shedding of blood deals with sins. If we're going to know how blood is shed, 
we need to relate very well with the day of atonement in the Old Testament. We need to go back to the Old Testament and look at the shadows so that from the shadows we can see exactly what happened in the reality. Leviticus chapter 16 verse 5. Please pay attention. It's going to be a long read. And it shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoats. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the Lord fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the lord and his hands full of sweet incense beating small and bring it within the veil and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. That is for the people. And bring his blood within the veil. And do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. And sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Next verse. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remain among them in the midst of their uncleanness. All right. So this is when he kills the first goat because there is already blood and that blood has an atonement made. The first goat. Now observe verse 18 to 19 of Leviticus 16. Pay attention. And he shall go out unto the altar. That is before the Lord. And make an atonement for it. And shall take of the blood of the bullock. And of blood of the goat. And put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his fingers seven times. And cleanse it. And hallow it for the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Now when is the atonement made? The atonement takes place when the priest enters into the veil. So under the old covenant, only the high priest could enter into the holiest of all. Into the holiest of all before God. That holy place under the old covenant is where God is. So he takes the blood to the holy place before God. And then when he gets there, he sprinkles it upon. Now please pay attention. Notice the remission of sins is only done when the blood is shed. The remission of sin is only done when the blood is shed. So question, where is the blood shed? Is it on the altar? No. The blood is not shed on the altar. When you place it on the altar, it becomes a sacrifice on the altar. That goat stops being a goat. It becomes the sacrifice. It identifies with the sin. It bears the suffering from that point you kill it. When you take the blood into the holy place, when you take the blood into the holy place, then you go into the holiest of all. Now, so for the first goat, 
He takes the blood into the holy of holies for the first goat, the blood of goats. So the question is, where is the blood needed? On the altar? No. The blood is needed on the holiest of all or in the presence of God. That is where the blood is needed. So why were the priests of the old covenant to offer animal blood? The priests were to offer animal blood because that was their ministry. Their ministry was to offer the blood. So you take the animal blood into the holiest of all. Then the priest will sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. The blood was to be sprinkled on the mercy seat. It is the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat that is called the shedding of blood. It is when the high priest will take the blood into the holiest of all and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That act is what the Bible explains as the shedding of blood. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1, pay attention. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service pay attention and a worldly sanctuary that is a physical building physical building next verse for there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread which is called the sanctuary three and after the second veil the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all verse four which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Next verse. I love the writer of Hebrews. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Next verse. Pay attention now. But into the second, when the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, so it is the sprinkling of blood that is done on the mercy seat. That is called the shedding of blood. So the shedding of blood takes place on the mercy seat. Where is the altar? The altar was outside. Outside where the people brought animals to. It was outside the holiest of all. Where do you kill the animal? The animal was killed outside the holiest of all. Now look at verse 8 of Hebrews 9. Pay attention. The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So when the physical tabernacle was there, the Holy Ghost was making indication that the altar, the new, the heavenly tabernacle was not yet made manifest. Because two of them cannot function at the same time. Next verse. Which stood only, the physical one stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the reformation. That was the practices, the practices that happened in the physical tabernacle in the Old Testament, a shadow. Next verse. But Christ, glory to God, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Next verse. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Next verse. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. The Old Testament was all about physical, physical, outside, outside flesh. Look at the next verse. Verse 14 now. How much more shall the blood of Christ 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see the contrast from what we just read. So the blood was taken to the holiest of all. This is Jesus. It wasn't metaphorical. This is real. Jesus literally entered with his own blood into the holiest of all, not the physical tabernacle, but into heaven itself. All right. So Jesus sealed the first priesthood, took blood into a worldly sanctuary. Because the first priesthood was worldly and physical. That was where the first blood, the blood of the old covenant went into. It went into a physical building. Into a physical. Everything was physical. Alright? Now, that's the old covenant. Then he said the blood of the new covenant will not be shared in the physical sanctuary. It will be shared in the heavenly. The blood of the new covenant will not be shared in the physical it will be shared in the heavenly building. Just like in the old covenant, when you kill the goat, you have fulfilled redemption in the old covenant. No, when you kill the goat, you have not fulfilled redemption. Remember, when the goat is killed outside, then the high priest will have to carry the blood and go into the holiest of all once a year and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That was the act of atonement. And that was the act of the shedding of the blood. So when the goat was killed, it was not yet over. There had to be the high priest carrying the blood and walking into the holiest of all. Please, that's very, very important. Now, so that sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat is what is called the shedding of blood. All right, now, please pay attention. Did you also see that the very act of redemption was behind the scenes? It was behind the scenes. The real act of the remission of sins under the old covenant was behind the scenes. Nobody was there. The priest alone, and you remember, they will tie a chain on his waist because they are not sure he will come out. Then the priest alone will take the blood and walk into the holiest of all. And then smear the blood or sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then the people outside, all the junior priests will be waiting. If he overstays and everywhere is quiet, they will know that something has gone wrong. Then they will use the chain to drag him out. That was the protocol under the old covenant. Even when the animal was killed, the process was not yet complete. So the killing of the goat that everybody was going to see when they killed the goat was the beginning of the act. It was the beginning of the act. So Jesus himself also, what did Jesus take into the holiest of all? He took his own blood. Jesus took his own blood into the holiest of all. What enters into the holiest of all under the old covenant? The blood. Okay. Where do you get the blood from? You kill the animal. So when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. Was he referring to redemption? No. Because he had not even died. Secondly, the blood has not been carried into the holy of holies. So when Jesus said it is finished, he was not talking about atonement. Because redemption has just started on the cross. That was just the starting point. So now, that is why 1 Corinthians 15 says that according to the scriptures, how that Christ died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures that's the gospel so it means that jesus died for three days please pay attention hebrews chapter 9 verse 21 moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry next verse and almost all things are by the law purged with blood 
and without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It was therefore, glory to God, it was therefore necessary that the patterns, which is the physical of things in the heavens, should be purified with animal blood. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than animals. The word better means eternal. Okay? With eternal, that's the word better in the book of Hebrews. Next verse, 24 now. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures or symbols of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Jesus appeared, not liquid. Jesus appeared in the holy of holies. Jesus appeared to appear in the presence of God for us. So the offering of Jesus' blood was not on earth. The blood of Jesus was not offered on earth. That means the one that came out of circumcision, the blood that came when they were beating him, the blood that flowed in the garden of Gethsemane, the blood that flowed when the crown of thorns was put on his head, was not the blood of atonement. Because the blood was not offered on earth. The blood was not offered on earth. Look at that Hebrews 9.24. See where the blood was offered. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So, that takes away the cross. That means, it is not at the cross I saw the light. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith, I received my sight. No, it was not at the cross that the body rolled away. The body rolled away when atonement was completed in the heavenly holy of holies. In the heavenly holy of holies. So, the offering of Jesus' blood was in heaven. So the sprinkling of blood is the shedding of blood. Under the old covenant, it is the sprinkling that is the shedding of blood. So the high priest actually applies the blood. Question, where does the high priest apply the blood? He applies the blood on the mercy seat. So when Jesus said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the sins of many. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Was he referring to the cross? Was he? No, he wasn't referring to the cross. So the death of the goat is the beginning of the work of redemption. So when Jesus said it is finished, what he meant was the fulfillment of the law. So Jesus fulfilled the demands of the law on the cross. That is the word telestatai in the Greek. Telestatai. Which means fully paid for or accomplished. That was the end of the law. That was the end of the law on the cross. It is finished. The law has been nailed and taken out of the way. Now. So let's look at a couple of things. Now, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15. Look at how the law ended. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law. So at that point, everything the Lord demanded, Jesus gave. But you and I know that there was sin before the law. Sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. So 
sin was only imputed by the law. So Jesus on the cross became a cause for the law. That was not the fulfillment of redemption. What happened on the cross was that the law ceased to function. The cross brought the law to its logical conclusion. You remember that when Jesus died, when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. Top to bottom. That was the end of the law. That veil was the demarcation between the Jew and the Gentile. Now, when Jesus died, it was torn from top to bottom, putting an end to the law. It brought the Old Testament to a logical conclusion. And I will show you intelligently how that happened. So if the blood of Jesus is for redemption, look at the following scriptures. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Please pay attention. In whom we have, have, we will not have. We already have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins. How? According to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2.13 But now, in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes we are far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So every one of us has been brought nigh by the blood of Christ. Redemption through his blood. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 18. Now, where remission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Next verse. Having therefore, glory to God, brethren, and the brethren in the building, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. How? By the blood of Jesus. Glory to God. By a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. So, the blood of Jesus grants access to God. Number one, the blood of Jesus gave us redemption. Number two, the blood of Jesus drew us nigh. Number three, the blood of Jesus grants access to God. So, the essence of that purification, please notice, the essence of that purification, notice that in the Old Testament, it says, he cleanses the tabernacle because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. So, he cleanses the tabernacle because of the transgression and uncleanness of the children of Israel. It is so that they can stand before God. So, when the high priest does the cleansing, then Israel can approach the tabernacle. They can stand before God. That is, it gives them access. But the blood of Jesus provides access. It provides for us a new and living way. No more physical tabernacle. There's a new and living way. So the question now will be, at what point did Jesus shed his blood? We have said, he shed his blood when he entered heaven. So, he couldn't have taken his blood to the temple on earth. To the tabernacle of Moses. Or the tabernacle of Solomon. Or tabernacle of Zerubbabel. No. The temple on earth had its own commandments. That's why Jesus couldn't go there. It was to offer the blood of animals. That was the first protocol of the temple on earth. So the priests on earth. We are. You know. They had their own role. To offer animal sacrifice. So Jesus took the blood into the holiest of all in the presence of God for us. In the presence of God for us. Please, that's very, very important. The blood was shed in heaven. Jesus died on the cross. But the blood was shed in heaven. The blood was not shed on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. But the blood of Jesus was not shed on the cross. It's not the blood coming out of the goat that is the shedding of blood. 
It is the sprinkling of the blood that is on the mercy seat. So that is why 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 says, And he is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation means mercy seat or propitiation means the throne of grace. Not only for us, but for the whole world. So Jesus is both the first goat, sacrificial lamb, Second goat, goat of escape. When he was killed physically, Jesus played the role of the first goat. When he died physically, he played the role of the first goat. When he was separated from God, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He fulfilled the role of the second goat, of the goat of escape. So both the first and the second goat are behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. Because the role of the fit man. Was to take the goat of escape. And history tells us. To a valley. And then release the goat. So that the goat cannot come back. To go into the forest. Alright. So all the activities. Remember the first goat. When the animal is killed outside. Where everybody sees when they are killing the animal. That is not where the shedding of blood happens. They will now take the blood. The high priest will carry the blood to the holy of holies where nobody is. Behind the scenes. Now the goat of escape is released to a wilderness. Behind the scenes. So both the first and the second goat. The activities happened behind the scene. The spiritual significance is that Jesus died physically and spiritually. Remember, physical death is the separation of the spirit from the body. Spiritual death is the separation of the spirit from God. Physical death, separation of the spirit from the body. Spiritual death, separation of the spirit from God. Those two things were accomplished by one person. So when he said it is finished, glory to God, he fulfilled the law. What he promised in Matthew 5, 17. That was his promise. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The word fulfill doesn't mean I have come to make you obey the law. Fulfill means I have come to meet the demands on your behalf and take it out of the way. So that it is no more relevant to you. That is what it means to fulfill. So there's something we now have to ask. Who normally entered into the holiest of all? Who normally will enter into the holiest of all? Because we have established that Jesus is the first goat and the second goat. Physical death and spiritual death. Now, but somebody has to take the blood where the animal is killed. To the holiest of all. And that person was one person. Now so far Jesus. Jesus had to enter the holiest of all. And he has to be the high priest to do that. So we need to know at what point did Jesus become high priest. At one point. Was he born a high priest? Was he made a high priest? Well we will see that intelligently. Now look at Leviticus for example. You know, the Old Testament was types and shadows, prophecies and promises of Jesus. You know, for example, that's why you shouldn't be afraid of reading the Old Testament. Like the book of Leviticus. You know, the book of Leviticus is a book of offerings. All those offerings is Jesus. All the offerings in the book of Leviticus is Jesus. Because the book is Jesus' book. So the message was not offerings. Rather, the message was the revelation it was conveying. Not the offerings. I can give you an example. Look at Leviticus chapter 2 verse 1. And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord. His offering shall be of fine flour. Fine flour. And he shall pour oil upon it. And put frankincense therein. Next verse. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons. The priest. And he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof. 
and of the oil thereof, and all the frankincense thereof, and the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So look at the elements. Fine flour, oil, frankincense, then burn it upon the altar. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. So Jesus is our offering. And in that offering, he says sacrifice and he says sweet smelling savour. So back to Leviticus. Fine flour. Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost. So being born of the Holy Ghost, no corruption. That makes him fine flour. Poor oil. He was anointed of the Holy Ghost. So because Jesus was anointed of the Holy Ghost, that was the oil. Number three, frankincense. Sweet smell. Jesus is the sweet smell. The sweet savour or our frankincense. Then he says, burn it upon the altar, which is separation. Jesus was separated for us. So, the same with Jesus. He will be offered to God as a sacrifice made sin. Jesus is actually the offering. He was the one offered to God. It's the high priest that takes the blood into the holiest of all. The holiest of all was not the only one or the earthly one. So, at what point, glory to God, at what point did Jesus become high priest? At what point, seeing he was two animals in one, at what point did Jesus become high priest? Stand on your feet, that's all I got for you, glory to God. At what point did Jesus become high priest? The good news is, Jesus is the first goat and the second goat. He has taken the cost, he has taken the penalty, he has dissolved the separation. And by Jesus, we have access into the holiest of all. By Jesus, we can approach the Father boldly, without doubt, without wrath. We can lift up holy hands in worship. Because of Jesus, we have access. The Bible tells us, therefore, being justified by faith, we have. Hallelujah. Being justified by faith. We have peace. The word Irene in the Greek. We have union with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom we have access. Oh, hallelujah. He has broken down the middle wall of partition and he has brought us nigh. We and God today, on the basis of what Jesus has done for us, we have a union that can never be separated. We have a union that can never be separated. Quicken together. Raised up together. Made to sit together in the heavenlies. We in him. He in us. No barrier. Listen carefully everybody. Sin can never stand between the believer and God. Why? Jesus is the mediator. Ah, you didn't hear that. Jesus is the mediator. You didn't hear that. Jesus is the mediator. So since Jesus is the mediator and he is the lamb of God that taketh away sin and he's the mediator between man and God. It means therefore that sin can never stand between God and man. Who stands between God and man? The mediator who has cured sin forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Jesus stands between God and man. So sin can never stand between God and man because the cure for sin the cure for sin is the one standing. And sin cannot say no because the cure cured it permanently. This man, yeah, 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 yeah. but this man, but this man, after he has offered one sacrifice for sins for how long? Forever! Sat down. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Sat down. 
He's the mediator between God and man. Glory to God. We have access. We have access into this grace wherein we stand. We stand on grace grounds and we rejoice in the glory of God. Lift your right hands wherever you are. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for revelation knowledge. Thank you that the eyes of your people's understanding are being enlightened. Thank you that your people are being established in this truth. The truth that is found only in Christ Jesus. I decree that the eyes of each one's understanding be flooded with light. I speak over you today. You walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. You are fruitful unto every good work. I decree that the eyes of your understanding are flooded with light. You know the hope of your calling. You know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know the exceeding greatness of his power to us. What? Who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he raised which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. I pray that revelation knowledge grows big on your inside. The revelation of Jesus until nothing else matters. I thank you, Father, for answer prayer. I give you praise and glory. Thank you for revelation, causing your people to rise up and live their fullness in Christ Jesus. We give you praise in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Glory! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service, what a word. I believe you've been impacted, affected with the word of his grace. Listen very carefully. It is God's intent for you to continue walking in this light. So I'm going to encourage you to keep following. Remember, every day, we're live right here on Facebook and YouTube. Every day, 12 noon GMT plus 1, 10 p.m. GMT plus 1. If you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship, where you're able to learn with other brethren, and beyond learning, where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you're being selfish. You're denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. It's such a joy to be able to serve you the grace of God. My prayer for you is that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light, that the reality of Christ will resonate in your mind we rebuke sickness, disease, oppression. We come against whatever is not planted by God in your heart today. We command it rooted out. And Father, we thank you for miracles, healings, and testimonies. In Jesus' name, amen. amen to your victory station.